Whether you're a chestnut farmer, a food lover, or simply curious about this versatile nut, Branching Out with United Chestnuts is your guide to a thriving chestnut community. So join us as we explore the many branches of the chestnut tree, uncover the untold stories, and branching out together towards a sustainable future. And now, your host of Branching Out, Melanie Jones. Thank you for tuning in to the seventh episode of the Chestnut Industry Podcast, Branching Out. We're releasing this right around Thanksgiving time in 2023, and I'm especially grateful for our guest today, Mr. Joel Hubbard. Joel is a CPA, a registered investment advisor, the founder of Executive Money Managers, and he's a longtime friend and financial guide to our family. Joel started his career as the controller for the Georgia Teachers Retirement System and then was the controller for Georgia Tech. He helped start a community bank, and he currently serves on a few board of directors. He's very well qualified, but one of the prime reasons we asked him to be a guest today on the podcast is because of his love for land and trees and his knowledge of how the two come together. When you meet Joel, you'll know instantly he has a servant's heart. I think his favorite saying is, I like to leave things better than I found them. Well, he and his family are certainly doing that with the land that is in their care. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I have and that you're having just a happy holiday season. Thanks again for tuning in. Well, good morning, Joel. Good morning, Melanie. Thank you for joining the Branching Out podcast. Um, it's it's really a privilege to have you join me today because you've just been absolutely invaluable to our family uh, and help guiding us on a financial path. And I know that our listeners will um, pick up some tidbits to help them. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I'd like to say as a CPA and a registered investment advisor, that what I'm going to say this morning is not to be considered financial advice or guidance from a professional. It's what I've done in my life and what I've helped clients do, but you need to speak with a professional that it becomes familiar or is familiar with your circumstances to get financial advice that works for your specific situation. Yes, that makes total sense. And you know, I think back to how did we meet you? And um, you know, over 10 years ago now, Brad and I bought our first timber property in Georgia <clears throat> and we financed it through Ag South, which is part of the Farm Credit Bureau. And we had asked them if they could recommend someone to help guide us uh, in the in purchasing land and timber properties. And so they recommended Mr. Joel Hubbard of Executive Money Managers and what we found out about you is that you yourself own a lot of land and you're a, a valuable resource to your customers on the, the the investment side of things as well. So you're walking the walk. And that was just, uh, it meant so much to us. And I remember that you talked to us initially about the importance of having a balanced portfolio. And so I thought maybe that's a, a good way to start here this morning is just having you provide an overview of what is a balanced portfolio. Certainly, Melanie. A balanced portfolio would have some amount of money in cash, if you will, in money market funds or things like that. But predominantly for investment purposes, you would have money invested in the stock market, in equity stocks, debt instruments, uh, treasuries, bonds, but you also should have money invested in real estate. That could be rental properties, or it also could be ag land, if you will, timber land, or land that grows an agricultural crop. Yes, and that's I think that's kind of in your blood, considering that you came from South Georgia, land filled with pecan trees, right? Yes, um, I did. I memories as a kid in South Georgia and Tifton, where I grew up, there were lots of pecans. In fact, I made money as a kid picking up pecans to take a date to a prom and buy a <laughs> if you will. But 
for a, a balanced portfolio, I, I would recommend having at least an exposure of, say, 10%, 15, 20, maybe even 25% uh, in my life, not for you would need to know the specifics of a person's life and their rif- risk tolerance, if you will. Mm-hmm. But the land is a counter cyclical thing against stocks and bonds. By that, I mean that when stocks and bonds are doing well, land may not perform as well. However, in market declines, if you will, market corrections, market pullbacks, agricultural, an agricultural position in your portfolio will balance that out. It's done that in our lives, in our family, in our portfolio and my clients. Yes, for sure. Um, So if you're talking about ag land as part of a diversified portfolio, um, talk to me about your research of uh, timber, pine tree plantations, versus uh, the the chestnut orchards. What have you found and what excites you about this? Certainly, uh, we started with ag land in what I knew was timberland, specifically in the Southeast United States, pine plantations. And that's what I got into. And that's what I knew. And we invested our family's money and recommended to our clients once we knew their situation, Pine Timberland. However, I met, was talking with my friends, Brad and Melanie, one day in my office and started asking questions about chestnuts and the revenue and got excited about growing chestnuts rather than as a food crop for uh, deer and other game on your land, but as a commercial venture. And I have gone to cutting down pine trees in my life, pine timberland, pine plantations, and planting chestnuts as a commercial venture. Uh, Because you were, you, uh, from your research, you kind of see that the uh, the long term revenue from a chestnut orchard compared to the life cycle of a pine tree plantation is more favorable. Absolutely. Um, chestnuts are 12 times more profitable than pecan trees in the reading and my research. I did a lot of extensive research before I did this for our situation. But chestnuts, chestnut plantations, chestnut orchards are many, many fold more lucrative in the long run. This is not a invest in it now and in a year or six months or two years. It's a long term investment and adventure, but it's infinitely more profitable than growing pine trees if done correctly. And there's risk, like with anything in pine plantations, there's risk from pine beetles, fire, timber theft, things like that. But done correctly, chestnut orchards, from my perspective, are infinitely better investment. Yes. Well, obviously, we agree because we're in this business, too. And one of the things that excites us, I think, is uh, because we we raise grow and sell trees is this idea of of people taking timber properties and converting it into orchards or things like I, the on the podcast not long ago was Jeremy Kaufman from Propagate talking about um, agroforestry and biodiversity of in of putting trees within croplands to diversify it and so you know we we can see that in our future so maybe instead of of your grandchildren picking up pecans to take someone to a date, they're picking up chestnuts, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it, yes, it's my dream was that at our home here in Social Circle, we planted che- uh, pecan trees around the hill, and I had fantasies of my grandchildren and I picking up chestnuts and me teaching them work and thrift and those sorts of things, but that's morphed into now harvesting chestnuts. 
Yes, yes, sir. Um, you know, in in purchasing land, as we learned early on, is there's a lot of different factors. There's there's ways to structure what you're buying, how you're buying it, the the financing vehicle. So, what are some of the tips, um, just high level, that you could share of, of why someone would benefit to call your firm um, to learn how to do this? Certainly, there's tax strategies as a CPA. And I've one of the things when you talk to a professional, you ought to ask them, are they doing it in their lives? The colloquialism, are they eating their own cooking? Mm -hmm. We do that. Um, our timberland is owned in a structure. It's not owned personally for my wife and I or by my children. It's owned in a structure. I recommend that to clients once you understand their specifics, there's tax advantages to putting land into an entity, tax savings. There's also liability protection from your personal assets, your personal wealth, if you put it in a structure. Yeah, um, I agree. And those are things that we really had to learn. And I think there's a percentage of the population that land is is given to them. It stays in the family, and that's an exciting opportunity to maybe put a new type of crop in it. But then there's other people like ourselves and and others in this is industry that we know where they're actually having to use their own capital to you know purchase the land, et cetera. So I think just I'm I I can say this for you that having the guidance of your of you and your team has been invaluable for things we would never have known, benefits that we wouldn't have gained if we didn't have the right counsel, which is why I wanted you to join the podcast, because I think there's a growing percentage of people that would love to own a piece of land and have it be be something that brings them some revenue. So, um, you know, that, that, that's really appreciate. Uh, th that kind of goes into the next category, which I know is meaningful to you, which is uh, multi-generational land ownership. Um, I, I was talking to you one time a while back where uh, I understood that you and your daughter, Dally East, uh, spoke at the Forest Landowners Association about this topic. So tell me a little bit about that. And if we're able to find that recording or presentation, we might be able to include it in the blog. Certainly. Um, I'd like to back up a second and talk about the history of the land. I was blessed to marry into a family that the land had, my wife's family land had been in the family for, I think it's now headed towards, with my grandchildren, seven generations. Oh my gosh. We have added to that land and I've been purposeful about adding to the land contiguous to our farm and then other tracts of land here in Georgia. But it's wonderful to inherit land, but if you're not so blessed to do that, you can leverage land or you don't have to always pay cash for land. You can use debt or leverage to acquire the land. And there's tricks and benefits, not tricks, but advantages mm -hmm. if you know what you're going to do, what your purpose, what your goals are for the land. You can build a business model, if you will, or pro forma that you take to your credit source like Ag South, and I've used them, and my experience with them was wonderful. Uh, you can use community banks. Um, how, 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 how do you um, compare those two, a community bank or a commercial lender versus a, a farm credit institution? Well, I have... As you know, Melanie, been involved and helped start a community bank in Atlanta. Typically, loan to value is 50% that you have to have 50% equity to buy it through a commercial bank. There are huge banks like Bank of America and other big banks that have a whole group of people that have clients that invest in Timberland. I have a friend that works for a large bank that should remain nameless, their minimum requirement is $10 million. So that rules out a lot of people. But mm -hmm. Ag South versus a community bank, Ag South is much more flexible on their percentage of capital. 
if you have other assets you can pledge, I won't speak for them, but it's much less than the 50% equity. So for a, per, a normal person who doesn't have just stacks of money, going through someone like Ag South is a wonderful attribute. And they're also a mutual fund in that they rebate part of your interest. And this isn't a commercial for them, but they rebate <laughs> It just yes. back as a refund, which is beneficial when you need to get a check every now and then. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so that that talks about the land, and and I've seen your land, and that you're maximizing everything you can possibly do to it, which is wonderful. Um, but talk a little bit about the the presentation that you and Dally did at the Force Landowners. Certainly, this is a issue. We presented at the Forest Landowners meeting several years ago in uh, the Grove Park in Asheville as an intergenerational transfer, if you would, of land between G1, if you will, and G2, my daughter. And you have to have buy-in. You have to have goals and objectives that are congruent, the last thing you want is you transfer it to the next generation. They cut the land into streets and put subdivisions in. There may be a place for that if as a city encroaches on your land, but you want to have congruent, congruent goals and objectives that if you're planting chestnut trees, which we're taking a old dairy farm that became a pine plantation that's now becoming a chestnut <laughs> orchard, how sad it would be that you planted chestnut trees and they're approaching really going into production. They go to the next generation and they're cut down or something like that, that you need to have congruent goals. And the way you do that or the way we've done it is I've been, we, my wife and I have involved our daughters in this process, uh, Dally, my daughter, and I went to get chestnut trees from a grower here in Georgia, and we loaded up in a huge, the largest rental truck the company had and drove <laughs> to South Georgia and picked up a thousand trees. It was an, an all-day adventure, if you will, and when we got back, we were both exhausted Saturday morning in our driveway. I'm unloading trees and my daughter Dally and her daughters, my granddaughters came over and it was a family family adventure, if you will, unloading those thousand trees. My wife Margaret was involved and we built memories doing that. You've got to have buy-in from the next generation. And if I may tell a side story, a few Saturdays ago, we were keeping our grandchildren for uh, an anniversary for my daughter and son-in-law. And that Saturday morning, I loaded them up in my RTV and we went out into our little chestnut orchard and we looked at the trees. We looked at the nuts on the trees. We harvested some nuts in the burrs and cautioned them not to get their little hands <laughs> And we pulled them open, and I explained the difference in a fertilized nut and an unfertilized nut in our chestnut orchard. And I talked to them about the future, that when they were grown women, they would be out there with their children harvesting chestnuts and getting buy-in. And the difference between a chestnut, and we have some walnut trees on part of our farm, explained that, and pecans. I rode around and taught them to identify the difference in a pecan tree and a chestnut tree, the leaves and the tree and everything. That is so important. I know on part of the property that we bought in Kentucky, it was kind of a situation where uh, the children just took the land and decided to cut a lot of the trees down and then sell it. And it, and it, and it is sad, but I think it, it does, it does really help to, educate them like you're doing to say this is something really really valuable um and so be wise in your decisions um i, I just love that um as younger girls we drug our 
daughters to many pine conferences, uh, sometimes not as happy to go as others. They went <laughs> on field tours. They sat in classrooms and listened to pr- presentations. But it caused them to have buy-in to what the family goals and objectives were. That's that's for sure. And we hear that from a lot of people that we talk to, that it's just, it's a privilege to be involved in this now and thinking ahead of, of the future generations and the earth. Planting trees is good for the earth. It's good for climate. And those little little girls of yours and our grandsons, you know, they're they're going to have to, to, um, to deal with, with climate situations. I know it's a political issue, but um, we, we need to plant as many trees as we can. Um, so let's think here. If um, what 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 suggestions do you have to people maybe thinking about starting in the chestnut business? Do you have any any tips from what you're learning? And certainly, certainly, if you're considering buying land, you need to first. What are you going to do with the land? Is it going to be it's is it going to be for recreation or is it going to be for investment? Um, I've owned land that sadly wasn't near the timber mills and I saw that the gentleman that bought it, bought it for hunting purposes, for recreation. Uh, it didn't make sense to grow pine trees because the mills were so far away. But mm-hmm. you consider what is your what are your goals and objectives? You need to look at things like the topography, the lay of the land, the soil type, uh, prior uses of the land, you know, what, what was done on the land? Um, did people dump things there? Did they, is the land eroded? Is it farmed out? The nutrients and minerals gone out of the land? Yes. Um, you need to consider your boundary marking, identification of the boundaries. Water sources for your land. Is there Are there natural water sources? We're blessed that on our farm here in Social Circle, One of the boundaries is a river. We have another, quote, river, but it's more like a creek that goes through our land. But we're blessed with water sources. Mm -hmm. You need to consider your neighbors. What are your neighbors like? Is it it an industrial thing? Are there subdivisions encroaching? Um, what What are your neighbors doing? You need to also consider how full, where you are and the path of growth. Uh, we're 50 miles, 50, 60 miles east of Atlanta. Growth is encroaching, coming this way. And as I am planting chestnut trees, and we're all in on chestnut trees, let me say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have purchased trees from Brad and Melanie, and they're wonderful trees. Brad grows great trees. Thanks, Joel. But I've read and worry that 15, 20, 30 years from now, that Atlanta will grow to the point that we'll have a mature chestnut orchard, but then it makes it so that it needs to go into other sources, subdivisions, and things like that. So you need to consider that. You need to consider the taxing authorities both locally, state, and the the tax implications on your land. Uh, Some states are more, and municipalities are more favorable to growing, to ag than others. So that that was a consideration as well. Boy, that's that's a wealth of information right there. And, And I can speak firsthand on one other thing, which is access to power and water. Because when we bought our first, parcel of land in Kentucky. It was simply recreational, a way to get away from Atlanta. And uh, there wasn't any power. We didn't really think to investigate it. So we learned and we put, we ended up putting power and water in, but I I think that's a good one. And then the other one is that um, I remember one time us having a consultation with you and you told us that uh, we weren't allowed to buy any more land at, at the moment because our we were so excited about it, but our portfolio was starting to get a little bit out of balance with too much land. So I think that's something too. You know, once you own some land, a lot of people want more because it's just such a, a privilege to have it. Um, 
the, to speak to that, Melanie, there's also, yes, the, a balance of your portfolio, but it's also timing of land. If you look in broad periods of time, say 10, 15, 20 years, at least here in Georgia, there's been cycles when you could buy land at a much better price per acre than other times. Right now, land is very expensive here. But if we get a financial correction, there'll be a buying opportunity. So you need to yes. consider that as well, the timing of your land purchase. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I'm not an expert in all of this, but uh, one thing that we found is some of the land that we bought had been um, – select cut plus so a lot of the trees were taken out but that didn't really matter because we wanted to plant trees anyway so we've been working to clear some of the scrub trees out and and create orchards so sometimes uh people can find a little bit of a deal with that too there, there's just a lot of variables which is why i wanted you to join and talk today because having someone that has done this and has so many perspectives that someone like Brad and I didn't have um, is is really important and, and helpful. So, Joel, if um, if someone, if a listener wants to reach out to your team, what is the best way for them to do that? Certainly. Uh, our team is Joel Hubbard, CPA PC. You can reach us at our phone, which is 770-953-1135. Okay. We're happy to help you and assist you and learn your circumstances, your situation, and give you the best financial advice, both tax-wise and uh, for investment purposes of putting your land, how to structure it, and, and that. We would be delighted to talk with people and help them and just enjoy talking about our ex common experiences in owning land and land ownerships the pluses and sometimes some minuses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, are you able to support people outside of Georgia? Absolutely. As a CPA, we have clients. I have clients that own land both here in Georgia. I have a family that owns land over in Alabama. Uh, other yeah, Kentucky. Clients that own land in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, friends and clients that own land in Kentucky. So absolutely. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Well, I just really appreciate your time today and uh, we'll, we'll get some of this information in the podcast uh, blog to be able to reach out if, if they're interested as well. And um, so I will see you soon. And thanks again for all that you do for so many. Well, thank you, Melanie. You're kind. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you and Brad as my friends and my clients and please give Brad my best. I'll do it. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Thanks for listening to Branching Out, hosted by United Chestnuts. For information about chestnut trees and chestnuts, visit unitedchestnuts.com. Subscribe to the weekly blog and join the United Chestnuts community Facebook group. Let's grow together.